Hello everyone. Are you ready for our final Safe Spaces Month event? Don't mind, my dishwasher is on in the background, so just ignore that noise. Our guest has arrived, um, but I just wanna preface again what we're doing here. So with Safe Spaces of the Month is really just an extension of um, Mental Health Awareness Month and with the recognition that, let me just make sure I accept her in here. Recognition that, you know, you know there's a lot going on in terms of health, but also in, in, um, in terms of racial inequity. Um, the most recent example I've seen was with um, Elijah McLean, which actually was a case that happened a year ago. Um, hello. Let me I'll turn this up a little bit. Hi. So I was just explaining a little bit about um, just the um, kind of the reasoning for why um, I created the Safe Spaces Month. Um, and I think we'll just have to continue things like this going forward. Um, finding finding more ways and more areas to um, find safe spaces and comfortable spaces, wherever, whatever that really means for um, different people, because I think we all have different ideas of like what is safe. So for me, for me, I really enjoy doing fitness. Like I created a whole fitness brand. That's like definitely my safe place, but that's not everyone's safe place. So a lot of people, it might be therapy, it might be um, socialization, you know. Um, so, so yeah, I think hopefully everyone can just find what works for them going forward because I just have this eerie feeling <laughs> that we're in this for like a long road. Um, but I don't know who I was talking to, but they were saying how they feel like um, this time around with like with Black Lives Matter that we do have a lot more, um, you know, quote unquote allies um, on on our side this time around. Um, and I, I can definitely remember Black Lives Matter back when I was in college in 2013, 2014. And it was not the same um, how it looked, not at all. Um, it was purely only black people and it was purely only a lot of younger black people. It was, you know, college age, um, early 20s. Um, and for the most part, I don't know if there was even a lot of support across the board. So, but anyway, <laughs> just wanted to preface that a little bit. So we have more people joining in. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, today's guest. So this is um, Miss Joyce Weston, and Joyce is a licensed clinical social worker. She be obtained her master's in social work from Loyola University Chicago and is the president and lead therapist of Amaralis Wellness Services, Inc. Joyce has over 12 years experience working with youth and families in various communities. Her work has also provided her the opportunity to supervise, train, and evaluate staff interns and volunteers. Joyce provides support to individuals, youth, couples, and families to assist them in weathering the storms of life, very similar to you know what's going on right now. Um, she believes that the power of talk therapy is creating a narrative for your life and the future that you desire. Having personal experience, Joyce specializes in working with women and couples dealing with infertility. She also provides clinical services to women in business who are seeking balance amongst all of life's competing demands. Yes. Um, additionally, Joyce offers Christian counseling, an intersection of practical and spiritual support. She believes that both the natural and spiritual needs to be addressed in order to see lasting change. Joyce's practice is rooted in just that, her belief in people's ability to create change. So she's the perfect person to talk to us today because we need change. <laughs> welcome, welcome Joyce. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, so everyone is here, more people will be joining in, but first question I'd like to ask you is what is your personal story and how is it connected to mental health? Uh, my personal story. Uh, <laughs> I 
feel like when you do social work and those kind of things, it feels like that's not a career path that you choose, one that chooses you. Uh, and so I always wanted to help. I consider the first thing. Um, but then I like, you're in high school, but fell in love with, with that. Then and uh, for a lot of years, I worked in administrator management program. That kind of stuff. Get back to the school piece of it. That's when I started. And see, that was post divorce, post lose. So I knew everything. I knew what it took for me to get to a place where I could thrive. Um, and so I would do support people. Their journey. Great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I don't know, and I don't know if it's just me. Um, it was, it was breaking up just a little bit on my end. Um, and I know, I don't know if it's just me. Can anyone else? Okay. I just wanted to make sure just from the beginning that, um, everyone could hear. Yeah, I just want to verify. Can someone in the live verify that they're hearing everything? Okay, I don't know how to oh, that's open. Is that better? That is better. Cool. I just want to make sure if someone can give me a thumbs up so we can keep keep going along. But I don't want to just continue. Okay, so someone else said it was a little bit. Okay. It, sounds, it sounds good to me now, though, so I think we're good. Okay. Um, awesome. Um, well, if you'd like to, since it was a little bit, um, the audio was a little bit off a little bit, um, could you maybe go over um, what is your personal story just so that we have it? Sure. I said, um, I'll be the, give the end of it. <laughs> the most important piece is that for a long time I did administrative work in my field. So I managed programs, developed team, you know, um, developed programs and those kinds of things. And about five years ago, I decided that I wanted to go back to direct work, working with people and doing the clinical aspect of things. And that was after a divorce, losing a parent and having a miscarriage. And so I knew what it took for me to get to a good place. And so I wanted to support people in getting to that place for themselves. Wow. That's, that is a lot a lot in like a short short period I'm, I'm sure um yeah so i think we'll talk about some of those things um later on i think this conversation probably they've all been really um really deep conversations but i think there's a lot of elements that a lot of people can relate with with this conversation mm -hmm. um so the second question is um about divorce a little bit and so divorce attorneys have seen an uptick in inquiries from couples about heading to divorce and they anticipate more people will file for a divorce as courts reopen in more states in the age of coronavirus why do you think this is <laughs> because people actually had to live together <laughs> uninterrupted mm -hmm. right because a lot of times yeah. when we are going through our day to day, if both people work outside the house and then by the time you come home and if you have children to get kids settled, cook dinner, do homework, or even if it's just the two of you, by the time you get home and go or go to the gym or go do whatever you're going to do, a lot of times we don't spend as much time with our partners as we think we do. And then yeah. now there was no place to go. And so we had, and so people are having to deal with all of the stuff that they have been avoiding for a while so I, I would venture to guess that that's part of the reason because you actually and then for some people it's just the fact that I had I got to slow down and think and I realized mm -hmm. like this is not where I want to be or this is not what I want to do and a lot of people um, I've seen a ton of posts about people saying you know this is this time has been good for them in terms of being able to yeah. sit down and planning and thinking about what they want their future to look like and if you're in an unhappy mm -hmm. marriage then maybe you don't want that to be your future Wow. Yeah, I'm not, personally, I'm not, you know, involved with anyone, as I will phrase it, but 
if I was, I could see that being, like, this could be a, a really great period for thinking about um, what you want from that person, what you want from that relationship. Mm -hmm. it, even friendships, too, I wonder. I'm wondering if this is challenging friendships as well. Like, um, you know, who are you really reaching out to within, like, maybe not so much right now, but, like, in March and April. So you really couldn't go very many places, but who, who are people actually reaching out to and who are they um, maybe not reaching out to? Like, that, mm -hmm. that's an indication of maybe where you are with that friend. Yes, for sure. Um, we're all experiencing this and everybody experiences it differently and so how we all handle it and or you know for some people I think it's just so and especially because it's not just a matter of being you know sheltering in place it's also we've also seen a lot of and especially depending upon where you work and some people have been personally impacted by the virus and for a lot of people it's like okay life is short so now what am I going yeah. to do or who do I or life is short who do I want to spend this life with who do I want to have in my life mm -hmm. what type of work do I want to do and so I can see a lot of things changing for a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. So in that way, it's like, it's just such a hard um, way to characterize it because like, I, I mean, I, I was telling you, like I know people who are affected and I know people who have lost loved ones. So it's like, I will never kind of phrase it in a way that's like, oh yeah, this is like some great thing. Um, but at the same time, it is helping a lot of people rethink about what what they want um, in, in this short life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I think we'll also hopefully have time for these two. Um, okay, so third question. The isolation caused by COVID-19 can make us physically distant from people but it can also bring us closer to each other. Have you witnessed this phenomenon? Well, I've heard a lot of people talk about that um, in various ways. So for some people, it's like the first, like the kids aren't going to practice and, you know, everybody's not all over the place. So just for people that live in the same house together, you're spending more time together and it could make you feel like, okay, we're closer together. We actually get to slow down. We actually get to have dinner together and those kinds of things. But even for people that don't live near you, I've talked to a lot of people mm -hmm. that have talked about being way more intentional and making time mm -hmm. for things um, mm -hmm. and for friendship. You know, I have, you know, I was talking to someone and she said, I just have more time to really check in with my friends and say, hey, how are you really doing? What's going on? And not just like the occasional text or, you know, just texting about random things, but to really sit down and have conversation. And some people have gotten really creative <laughs> um, in terms mm -hmm. of like virtual, you know, brunches and um, cocktail hours and all that kind of stuff, just to really check in with people. I know uh, I had a student that shared with me that her and her family, that this allowed her distant family um, to get closer together. And they were doing like things like, um, a virtual bake-off <laughs> and those kinds of things and just checking in on each other. And she was like, we developed a, a family, um, you know, email chain and text message thing just so everybody can check in and make sure that everybody is okay. So it could help some people get closer. Yeah. I love to hear that. Like, um, I was talking to one of my colleagues, I don't know when, I think a couple days ago, um, and she asked me about, like, I think it was, oh, it was about Father's Day, and I had told her that, like, you know, we, in my family, we don't really do celebrations. We don't really have a big Mother's Day, Father's Day. Honestly, Christmas, like, we're really chill, um, but how when I have my own family, I plan to, like, do more of those sorts of things. So it's good to hear that people are doing that and, like, really keeping that bond strong. Um, mm -hmm. um, all right. See, number four, so there's 10 questions, so get those. Um, COVID-19 is expectedly impacting relationships for couples, particularly for young or newly formed. What can couples or, you know, people in um, relationships do to save their relationships in these times? Um, I think people have to check in and be honest, um, which is something that I think that 
one of the things that I talk about when I do couples work all the time is that we make a lot of assumptions, right? So we, mm -hmm. and what we do is we hold our partners accountable for things because we feel like, oh, you know me, you should know that. Or that's, mm -hmm. you know, I've heard so many times, well, that's just common sense, so you should know this. But, <laughs> we're, but what we're doing is holding our partners accountable th for things that we've never asked for, right? And so mm -hmm. it, and it can be something as simple as saying, hey, how do you feel like things are going or what's a concern for you? Um, what do you feel like is working? What do you feel like isn't working? Let's figure out how can we, and I'm, I, I don't know any other way to say it, right? But how can we negotiate some terms here, right? Because I may want one thing and you may want something else. And so but we have to figure out what's the middle ground. And sometimes it's just a matter of hearing our partners and saying, oh, I didn't know that you needed me to do more of that. Or I didn't know that that works your nerves, right? And so, and being able to have those honest conversations and checking in and just saying, hey, because so oftentimes we're like, I hate it when you do this or I need this. And, and sometimes we have to check in and say, well, what do you need? Or how are you feeling? Or what's going on? Mm -hmm. I think um, the other, really, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Mm -mm, you go. No, 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 I want you to finish your thought. <laughs> I thought you were done. <laughs> I was going to say the other thing that I wanted to say too was learning to speak and interpret each other's love languages. And so um, I think we have to be very intentional about that because a person can be loving you in their own way, right? But if that's not my love language, I don't receive it that way. You can think I'm doing everything right, but I'm like, that's not what I need from you. We're oftentimes we're doing what we want to, you know, we're doing what we want to do or what we think is best, but that's not what the person needs, right? Because you can sense my love language is, um, words of affirmation. So you can mm -hmm. buy me gifts and send me flowers and do all of those things. But if you don't say, if you don't encourage me, if I don't feel, you know, supported and you don't, you know, say certain things for me, then I'm not feeling loved. Right. I, I think I heard that once, but I always forget. That's kind of what I meant um, with the um, a question that's coming up. But I like the way you phrase it as love languages and how everyone has kind of their own. So I guess everyone has their own, you know, communication method, but also that's could be very different than mm -hmm. their love language. Um, oh, yeah. So I was going to say, I don't know why. I think it was because in preparation for this conversation, but um, I started watching Married at First Sight. And what's interesting about this um, is the, all the people on there, they're like within my age range. And so that took me back because like there's one person, um, I'm not going to name names because I don't want, you know, they're on TV. But anyway, the one person, he said he wanted to be married since he was 22. And I thought that was like, whoa. And then all the other, so basically, if I'm talking specifically about the black couples, they're all, I think, 27. Or like they're like 27, 28. I'm like, I just turned 26. My brain is not in, in marriage <laughs> right now. I'm like, but they're like so settled. They're like, yes, and this is what I want. And I'm like, I have a lot of work to do in one year <laughs> to be at their level. Um, but but yeah, that was just like a tangent. I was really interested to see like they were they're literally the same age as me, mm -hmm. but they're ha they're ready for that commitment. Yeah, or so they think, right? <laughs> I guess so. I haven't finished. I'm on like, I'm, oh, is it? I think, yeah, I, I have a lot of more episodes to go, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so moving on to another area of your, your focus, um, I've actually read that even though fertility issues affect both men and women, um, women do feel particularly pressured when they do come up. And why do you think this is? And I, I ask that kind of loosely because, of course, the woman is the one, you know, to, to give birth. But it is, it is an interesting kind of psychological mm -hmm. thing. Well, we're on a different time frame, right? Men can have babies mm -hmm. for many years after um, yeah. that mm -hmm. we can. And so for, you know, there are men that have children into their 60s and 70s and for women the window is much smaller and so um and the older you get the more quickly you know your fertility diminishes and uh, the possibility of birth defects increases and so you feel you know oftentimes women feel like we're on the time crunch right and so 
And also, I think just socially, we're asked more about it than men are. Very rarely do you hear somebody walk up to, you know, <laughs> walk up to a guy mm-hmm. and say, when are you getting married? When are you having some kids? You know? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so, and even if you're, if a couple is out together, they're looking at the wife and saying, well, when are y'all going to have some babies? Right? And so, yeah. um, if you, it can cause us to feel more pressured. Uh, and I think it's just like, you feel like as a woman, like this is one of the things that should come easiest to me. Right. And so you just feel wow. like, you know, what, that's, that's the thing. You're a girl, you know, it's like for so long, it's just been grand in your head. You're a girl. At some point you're going to be a mom. And then when you, um, when it doesn't come easy, it's, it's devastating. Wow. And then I think even more so for black women, because for so long, that's just how, we've been stereotyped, right? It's like, we are, we are baby machines. And so when you can't get it, when you can't get pregnant easily, it makes you feel like, okay, well, what's wrong with me or what's going on with me? Um, And so it's, it's, it's difficult for any woman. Yeah. And that's, that's another part of the, like the research that I did before, um, before this event, because I wanted to look into the stereotypes and how, fertility was connected to race um and it is it is related to like the stereotypes from slavery it's like Mm -hmm. oh you know black women um are expected to be able to have many many babies but that's not always the case and um it also the research i found also said that black women are less less likely to seek like the ivf um than other women Mm -hmm. just because it's not i mean and i think there are many factors, but I think part of that is because we don't talk about it as much. It's not normalized in our community. And then don't be Christian on top of that because <laughs> we don't talk about it as uh, as African Americans. We don't we don't typically talk about it in the church, and so it's not as normal. And then also just the access to self to to health care, um, and that speaks to the equity part of it too. Like I had to fight my gynecologist for him to give me a referral for a fertility specialist because he was like, um, he was like, Oh, you haven't been, you all haven't been trying that long. And I'm like, I'm over 35 and it's been over six months. And he was like, no, it's a year. And I said, no, I'm over 35. It's six months. And I need a referral to see a fertility specialist because I had HMO at the time. And so, um, it's, it's just not something that we talk about or that we're as educated about, even though it impacts us at a higher rate. Infertility mm-hmm. impacts black women at a higher rate than other races. Yep, I did. I did see that too. Mm-hmm. And, al- and also the peak, the peak, like the, a woman's most fertile age is like 25 or 24. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, but it's like our most people in relationships that they feel confident about having a child at that, at a, that age. Cause I mean, I know I certainly am not. So it's like, it's such a hard, like, mental switch because I know for sure like at this age I do have kids but it's not really it doesn't feel like it's up to me it's when I you know find that person mm-hmm. but I'm 26 and it's already you know <laughs> the look box already running down mm-hmm. so at 35 that's really not that far for me so mm-hmm. it's just it's like yeah it's, I mean I think at this age I think I'm going to start thinking about this a lot more so I'm glad to be able to speak with you about it. Mm-hmm. And I've made it part of my life's mission to talk about it, to make it a conversation that we have in our community, to make it a conversation that we have in the church, to make it a conversation that we have with young women. Because oftentimes, mm-hmm. you know, they, you feel like you have time. I'm like, well, just mm-hmm. go just go get a fertility checkup and see what's happening. Um, and a lot of times our counterparts will freeze their eggs and we don't think about that or mm-hmm. talk about that. And so... I tell women to consider that as well. Yeah, I didn't, I realized I didn't ask the question specifically about like the, like the faith element. I don't, or my, I think I put it at the very end. Um, mm-hmm, you did. But, okay. Cause I think, I think that's a really interesting piece of it that I'm, I'm personally not as familiar of, of like, um, of how someone in the church would respond to IVF do you know these sorts of things um and i don't know hurtfully <laughs> my experience has been hurtfully <laughs> yeah. um because oftentimes mm-hmm. there's it's a sense of well you know you just have to wait or you just pray like i have it you know or like you're not praying mm-hmm. hard enough and mm-hmm. you 
people will try to make you feel like if you move forward through into fertility treatments, then you're taking God out of the equation. But there are no guarantees. You can go through IVF is is arduous <laughs> to say the very least, right? Um, physically, emotionally. And at the, you can go through the entire process and still not end up being able to harvest any eggs or still not end up with healthy embryos or implant healthy embryos and they not take. And so God's hand still has to be in it. So don't tell me if I do IVF that I'm not, that I don't have enough faith, right? Because we tell every, anybody else, it's a, for infertility is a medical diagnosis. When anyone else has a medical diagnosis, we tell them to seek treatment, right? You don't tell a person... You don't tell someone, well, don't get chemo, just pray. Mm, yeah. Yeah, one of our, oh, the Tom's on here. Um, she says that, she, she just is expressing that, a similar sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think it's something for me to look into. Because, I mean, I would want to be accepted regardless of the, that, of the decision that I make, mm -hmm. I think. Um, especially if I make it like I'm actually, you know, I don't want to put all my business out, but like I'm actually very traditional. Like I, I kind of envision, um, you know, being married and and then like maybe waiting some time, getting to know that person, and then having kids. But mm -hmm. if you're 26 right now, you know, then you have to give yourself that time to meet that person and then have those kids. Most, especially if it's multiple within a certain time frame and if I do the math it's like well, I hope I find someone like tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow tomorrow a couple months from now mm -hmm. <laughs> so but anyway um uh let's see so kind of switching gears um because I was really interested in hearing about your work with homeless youth mm -hmm. um and I wanted to hear more about that experience um, for you and how are they particularly vulnerable for mental health struggles? So a lot of the youth that I work with, I provide clinical services at an organization that has uh, drop-in services and emergency beds for youth that are 18 to 24 years old. And so a lot of them are there because they um, are LGBTQIA and their families kick them out of the house um, or disown them. Um, and a lot of them aged out of DCFS and foster care. Mm -hmm. And so um, their stories are, I, I'm grateful and it's rewarding work, but it can also just be very heartbreaking because it's like, how do you kick your child out of the house because of who they want to sleep with? Like, you know, so it's, it's just very interesting um, at times. And there have been times that I'm like, okay, I feel like I did good work. And then other times that I'm like, I'm going to go home and cry. And so um, I think the mental health piece, though, is that a lot of them, especially those that have been um, through DCFS, for like some of them got diagnosed and have been on medication since they were seven or eight years old. And so some stuff I'm like, were you even old enough to get diagnosed with that? Um, a lot of them will have multiple diagnoses that they don't mm -hmm. understand or that are inaccurate because they were mm -hmm. they were diagnosed with something when they were 10 or 11 and it has followed them, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. just trying to help them to get connected to a psychiatrist and, and working with, with me to figure out well, what's the right diagnosis and, and how to manage it. Medication isn't for everybody. <laughs> Um, and they, but then other ways so that they can live and move forward with their, with their lives and get housing and stable jobs. And I think oftentimes we, when we think about homeless youth, it's kind of like, well, first of all, how does a youth become homeless, right? And then mm -hmm. also under the, the same thing of being able to advocate for themselves to say, hey, I don't agree with this diagnosis or this is, you know, I don't, this medication isn't working for me. So oftentimes they just feel like they're, in those that are on medication, they just get prescribed something and they take mm -hmm. it and it may have the worst side effects. And I'm like, did you talk to your psychiatrist about it? And they're like, no. Or they said that they did talk to their psychiatrist and the psychiatrist responses, but just give it some more time. But mm -hmm. if this was another, or someone in another population, the psychiatrist mm -hmm. will hear them out and say, okay, well, let's figure this out. Let's adjust your dosage, right? And so being able to support them and advocating for themselves and even understanding what their diagnosis is because um, 
oftentimes people they're just told hey you're bipolar and i'll ask them well do you understand what that means do you know what the symptoms are and they don't because no one they've just been given this label and no one has explained it to them right and especially um someone should advocate for them when they're under 18 but especially if they're 18 to 24 mm -hmm. because you're technically an adult so yeah. mm -hmm. this is really interesting i've i've learned so much about um, homeless youth and some of the, the, the barriers to care um, just from being in Chicago because it unfortunately is a really large population um, of youth and um, so yeah I mean I think hopefully we'll find some strategies I think to combat some of the, the issues facing mm -hmm. youth in Chicago but um, there, it's a long list of things like I, I heard just now that um, the city's trying to work to get Wi-Fi or like internet for the whole, for a majority of Chicago public school students. Um, and um, yeah, we can talk about that offline. I, I, was, I was still a little bit surprised that it took this long to have that option, mm -hmm. um, but that's just, that's just me. Um, okay, so next question. All right, so communication is a lost art, um, especially in relationships. Can you talk a little bit more about why understanding how people communicate differently, um, i.e. communication styles matters? And then I wrote avoidant, accommodating, compromise, passive and aggressive in um, quotes. Um, because we have to know how a person communicates. Again, it goes back to not just knowing how I communicate, but also understanding how my partner communicates and if I'm okay with that, right? So first of all, it requires a person to acknowledge and be honest about how they communicate, right? And then mm -hmm. um, before you get into a relationship to talk about, about those things and set some boundaries and expectations, right? So for me, one of the questions that I asked before I started dating someone is how do you handle conflict? Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so How you? Uh, I'm serious <laughs> because it that's because some type people are like I need a minute, right? And other people, mm -hmm. and for me, I there was a and then even understanding that that can change too, right? Because for me, I was like, mm -hmm. let's talk about it, let's deal with it right now. And now I'm like, let me take a minute, right? Um, in in being an understanding that your partner may want to talk about it right away and then some you know somebody the other person wants to walk away and they need a minute and so um mm -hmm. even having a discussion to say okay I mean I and I literally had this discussion he's like I need a I need like two or three days and I was like yeah I'm not okay with that <laughs> right and so and it was mm -hmm. like well I, that's how I am like I <laughs> need to <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna you're like no you're not gonna go two to three days without talking to me because when you're ready to talk i'm not gonna i'm not gonna talk to you no more at all so like really having that discussion and then it was like okay mm -hmm. like eight to twelve hours right and just really again mm -hmm. going back to that, that discussion about negotiating right and being honest about it and saying mm -hmm. hey i need a minute and sometimes people feel like we have to deal with this right now but sometimes mm -hmm. it's better to walk away with it because i i mean it, for me even sometimes i I'm like, let me not say this out loud. And I write it out, yeah. right? So I can yeah. draft a text message or email and I walk away from it. And the next day I go back and I read it. And sometimes I'm like, okay, this is solid. I meant what I said. This is how I feel. And then other times I read it and I'll be like, oh, you was in your feelings. You was tripping. This ain't even that important. <laughs> so, but I, so that helps me that I'm glad that I didn't say anything because mm -hmm. it could have turned into something else mm -hmm. when it wasn't even really mm -hmm. about my partner or my friend or whatever that was my own stuff and so taking a minute to i think that's just important knowing when to give each other some time um mm -hmm. and figuring out what because you can have your communication style and i have mine but how are we gonna make this work together yeah i really and that's what they say like for writing emails and stuff like if you're if you always take a break like if you get if you get an email you don't really like take a day or so but technically that's the same it should that's the same way it should be for relationships like if there's a conversation that makes you feel charged in some sort of way like 
take a step back and maybe write down what you're feeling and then edit it a little bit um, mm -hmm. and see like, okay, like a couple of hours later. I never think about, you know, using a similar practice to to really like work, honestly, for relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they're all relationships. Yeah, because I mean, the other thing that we have to remember too and why we want to be careful with communication is because I can remember as a little girl, my mother, we, me and my sisters would do something and we say, I'm sorry, mom. And my mom would say, don't be sorry, be careful. Right. And so the older I've gotten, I realized the importance of that because you can apologize mm -hmm. for some behavior or something that you said, mm -hmm. but you can't take it back. Right. And so we want to be careful about what we're saying. So, and then mm -hmm. also, cause we know what we want to say and we know what we meant but that's not always mm -hmm. how it lands on our partner's ears, right? And so it's mm -hmm. not just about communicating and saying, well, we talked about this, but did we have effective communication? Did you walk away with the same understanding that I walked away with? Yep. Yep. This is, everyone who's in here, this is a, this is a free <laughs> lesson. This is, this is, these are real nuggets of wisdom. I'm taking notes. I'm, yeah. <laughs> um... Okay, so we are moving right along. Um, we talked a lot about communication, um, and now we can talk a little bit more about equity. We talked about equity as well, mm -hmm. um, but, but how is equity in creating safe spaces um, very important for your work? Um, it's super important because just in general, I feel like we have to get to a place where we understand that being healthy mentally and emotionally is just important. It's just as important as being physically healthy, right? And so making sure that when we're talking about funding um, for certain programs and insurance coverage is um, that mental health is right up there with everything else, right? So because some insurance plans will cover, and even Medicaid, it's like, okay, you'll cover an abortion, but you won't cover therapy, you know? And so it's just like yeah. those kinds of things, um, to make sure that, yeah, right. So, but to just make sure that we are, that we understand how important mental health is. And then another reason why it's important too is because you want to make sure that oftentimes the therapeutic process works better when you when you are sitting with someone who understands your experience, right? And so, and that can be multiple things. So most of the time, um, I've, I've like one of my friends, he said that he saw, a, um, like his insurance just, he just went to the therapist that his insurance sent him to. And he's a black man. He was a black man in his thirties. And she mm -hmm. was probably a white woman in her, in her fifties or sixties. And he was like, I felt like I was interpreting what I was trying to say the whole time. Like right. I just couldn't say oh, wow. what I wanted to say. And my therapist understood what that meant. And so just making sure part of the equity in this field too, is, is making sure that whoever you're seeing is culturally competent. Um, or even understands what it is that you want to work on. So part of the, uh, the other reason why I started my practice and why it's part of my practice is too, because when I started looking for a therapist to process my fertility challenges, I could not find anybody in the city of Chicago who looked like me who did that work. Wow. They were all white women. Wow. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm, wow. I want to fill in this gap. That blows my mind, especially because it's a large, it's a large city. Mm -hmm. So that goes to show it's not, you know, wow. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's important just to have people who look like you and people who know your experience as well. Mm -hmm. um, because like the more that we, we like, I, I don't know. <clears throat> I think these conversations about diversity um, and, and inclusion in these things. Um, now that we're facing a lot of um, attention to, you know, diversity and inclusion, I think we have to be really specific about like what we mean. Um, and, you know, I think that like, there, there's so many levels to it. Like, for example, if someone wanted to talk about, you know, a fertility concern um, that they were facing, I think like, you could talk to a black woman or you could talk to a black woman maybe within your age range who has a background that is like similar to you i think there's like just so many levels mm -hmm. to yeah for sure yeah 
that's like one thing I'm like the more that I see more and more conversation around um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and like belonging, um, I hope it doesn't become like lumped into one one like large um, you know uh, area because there are a lot of nuances to it. Yeah, and I think you have to give people like the. Um, I guess you have to just be respectful to everyone's experience. And, like, I think that's something that I try to do. Like, I, I, I respond to things when I feel like I have a background and understanding of it. And if not, then I just make sure I'm learning. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, that's, like, one of my main fears going on right now because there's all this attention to it. And I'm like, right. That doesn't always mean that we're going to really attend to all of the needs and i think we as like black people i think we understand what we need but i don't know if like the large um consensus of everyone like i can't i don't want to i don't want to leave it to literally one sort of corporate model mm -hmm. to yeah yeah and it looks different in different areas right so because what they label things as or what you focus on a higher ed versus what you focus on in corporate mm -hmm. America versus when you're talking about healthcare. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of people don't really get like they get equality and equity confused. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, um, oh, yeah. So um we're not just talking about equal, you know, mm -hmm. it it's equity is different than equal you know, just giving somebody the same amount, right? And so um mm -hmm. understanding what that looks like and then like you said, being very careful about, okay, when we talk about inclusion, who are we talking about and what's our focus? Because like for me in social work, oftentimes my frustration is when people talk about diversity and inclusion, it's like all people of color and LGBTQ mm -hmm. community. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, and so those are separate yeah. issues. Right. And so, um, just have being able to have that conversation though, and understanding that, you can't just address it all because all of the issues are different. Um, yep. So that's, I think that might be one of the first steps that we have to make, you know, we have to make clear what, what, are, what are we doing and which populations are we talking about? Definitely. Definitely. I know that's something that I personally had to really dig into when I created Communicate for Health Justice because I wanted to attend to like everything but I have to find the niche and I have to know when to segment because that's actually part of communication. Like they literally taught us that in school, like how to segment your audience. And so um, it's, it's a challenge, but um, it is important or else you end up like literally lumping everyone together. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, good, good conversation. Um, and then question. How can people navigate their relationship within the, and I don't usually use this term because I've seen a lot, like whenever people put like racially charged, racially, racially stoked, all these things in the news when they don't want to say like racism, um, but I put mm -hmm. it here. So back to the question, how can people better navigate their within the racially tense environment so you break up a little bit, so I'll repeat the question just to make sure that it's clear. Oh. You asked about how can you ask how can people better navigate their relationships within the racially tense environment that we're in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Short answer is very carefully. <laughs> um, because oh. I think we also I think first of all, I think we have to be honest about how much conversation you can take, right? Because for some people, <laughs> um, it's not something that that for multiple reasons that you can have a whole lot of conversation about because it's it's we're always getting information information is always coming at us right and so understanding and, and being able for some people just being able to say hey i need to unplug right i can't have this conversation i can't watch that video i don't want okay. to see that i don't want to be exposed to that right and so mm -hmm. and i think oftentimes people are afraid to say that because it makes you feel like mm -hmm you're bowing out of the discussion, but really it's like, I am protecting my own mental health, right? And so, yeah. but then when you do have those discussions to understand that we are all, we can all experience these events, but the impact on it for us is different, 
right? Because how mm -hmm. all of this impacts me and my in and my experiences may look different than somebody who it may be somebody who is the same age and a, an African American woman just like me, you know, but they still may experience it differently just because of yeah. where they grew up or the relationships that they have, right? And so not assuming that we're all going to feel the same way about it, not assuming that we're all going to have the same opinions as to how to address the issues, right? Because some people mm -hmm. are like um, peaceful protests and other people are like, well, let's burn everything down and start mm -hmm. over. Let's show them that mm -hmm. we're serious. And then I hear a lot of people like, well, what are we doing? What are we asking for? Who's strategizing? You know, and so everybody's not going to be on the same page. So understanding that if, when you have these discussions that you have to be prepared for whatever somebody's response is and they might not agree with you. Right. Um, and it also might expose some stuff. Right. I've seen a lot of people on social media talking oh, about yeah. how I unfriended mm -hmm. people. I unfriended mm -hmm. people on social media and I unfriended people on, in real life. Right. <laughs> about everything that's mm -hmm. happening. And so you have yeah. to be um, prepared for that. Right. And then in, in some mm -hmm. relationships, we just might not. We may we may decide that it's OK to not talk about it. Um, and sometimes we got to have some hard discussions because I imagine people that are mm -hmm. in biracial relationships are, mm -hmm. are are having some interesting discussions right now, right? <laughs> so even, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of different ways mm -hmm. that it can go. And I think you have to, the person that you're talking to, you all have to figure out how deep do we want to go, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, that was, that was such a good answer for, for that. Like, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have unfriended or unfollowed. I know a lot of people have. Um, I think for me, like, I want to be able to have deeper conversations with some family about things. Like, they're, like, again, I don't want to, like, throw people under the bus, but it's, like, I, I, you know, there. I don't think there's ever a time. Like, I understand the mental health piece of removing yourself from things. But if it's not really because of mental health, if it's, if you just feel like, oh, that, that issue doesn't affect me, when in reality it does, then that's a conversation that needs to be said. Yeah. Um, it's not you saying, oh, I need, but, sorry, I didn't mean it that way, but like, it's not you um, taking time for yourself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, you know, just if, if one person is, you know, treated miserably and like this, this one young boy, you know, who, who was murdered last year, um, Elijah uh, McLean, like, you know, just because I didn't know that person doesn't mean I can see that, okay, let me just go on with my day because I have X, Y, Z. And like, I just feel like I know a lot of people um, like that. And I think we just need to have some deeper yeah. conversations, um, especially like now that I feel much more confident with, you know, my, my, um, my voice and my understanding of things. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I think we, yeah, I mean, I'm, and not to say that we shouldn't chat. I think sometimes we have to challenge mm -hmm. people too, because oftentimes it's like, if it, if, if you haven't been directly impacted, you know, even mm -hmm. for some people, like, even with, even with everything that's happening with COVID, right. There are some people mm -hmm. that's like, Oh, it's still, it's so it's a farce. It's it's a made up thing, you know. But let someone in their family pass away from it, then it's like, oh, wait a minute, this thing is real, right? And so, oftentimes mm -hmm. we feel like if it doesn't directly impact us, then it doesn't mm -hmm. impact us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so when well, when we begin to understand that what impacts our community impacts us, right? Because just because I no longer live in this in, in an area where these things happen doesn't mean that it can't happen right or that right. it won't it, that it you know i think sometimes when you know people are like well i that won't happen i live in the suburbs or i live in a safe right. area and it's just like but when you're driving down the highway or you're on vacation mm -hmm. or anything else like this still yeah. impacts you and even if it you don't feel like it impacts you now and for a lot of women it may just feel like well that's you know that's that's the men right but you what about your son what about you know and mm -hmm. so even talking mm -hmm. to because i challenged a friend of mine that he mm -hmm. is not african-american um mm -hmm. but he he's here and i'm like you know and so we have a lot of discussion around that um but she's i'm mm -hmm. like you are african right you are from mm -hmm. the continent mm -hmm. of africa but do know mm -hmm. when anybody besides black people <laughs> 
and and maybe a few other ethnicities look at you they see they look at you and they see a black man right and so this is so even though you're like i'm not black it's like you know you also have to understand how you perceive what your experience is and what that's gonna look like for your kids right and so um, mm -hmm. So we, I think we do have to have some dark, hard discussions. I think we do have to challenge um, mm -hmm. some of the people that we love and that we have relationships mm -hmm. with to say, hey, like, I get that you might not want to talk about this all the time, but let's mm -hmm. talk about it. And what is, what's the reality? And here's our part or here's how it, you know, and for the people that say, well, it doesn't, it doesn't impact me. Well, let me tell you, it does impact you. And let me tell you how, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we definitely have to have some hard discussion. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, and I like your point about like how you be perceived on the outside because like that, I have no control over how I'll be perceived. Like, mm -hmm. and neither does, neither does someone who like people um, biracial relationships. Like if you have a child, you can't control how society's going to see your child. Like, so if you're a black um, man and a, and a white woman, like, you can't control how someone will see your child. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, I mean, I can't, I don't want to speak, but I think that's the way I would go about it if I was, like, that I, I need to make sure my child has an understanding of how the world will see them, <laughs> and then go from there. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a lot. These are deep conversations, especially when you start talking about kids, and I think it's because other people, you know, it's interpersonal. Yeah. All right, and final question before we have other questions that people can ask. Um, when you work with people who are believers, um, what you know, regardless of what faith they are, or maybe there's some differences as well. Yeah. Um, how yeah, how is faith integral in your work? Well, for me personally, my faith is at the center of my work. Um, I believe mm -hmm. that the work that I do is is ministry, and so it's very important for me and I'm always trying to be um conscious and present with my clients on every level you know not just physically but spiritually I honor whatever they say their spiritual beliefs are I do have clients that come to me because I share that I'm a Christian right and so um people that come to me because they want somebody who is a Christian but I don't that doesn't like that's not something that I ask or if I'm, I've worked with client um, clients who have who have different faith beliefs right or no mm -hmm. faith belief at all right and so mm -hmm. um, but when someone comes to me and, and they say that well part of the reason why I want to work with you is because you are a Christian or I'm looking for someone who is a Christian I always ask them um, are you looking for a therapist who is a Christian or are you looking for Christian counseling because that's two different things <laughs> And then wow. um, also being able to create a safe space where people can talk about how their faith guides um, and intertwines um, their li and intertwines with their lives or guides their decisions without feeling mm -hmm. judged, right? I'm not going to question if you say you feel like you heard God say or the spirit led you to do X, Y, and Z, right? And so I under, you know, I, I'm going to respect that. And, um, and I think, the other piece for me too is helping people too because for so for and this is not just about faith just in general people f find themselves living for other people right and so um it's like well this is i did because that's what was expected of me or that's just what that's how i was raised and so being able to say okay that's how you're raised but now you're an adult and so what what do you want to do right or what best serves you and then in terms of faith I, I enjoy being able to help process, you know, helping people through the process of of sifting between what's religion versus their their faith and their, you know, the you know, religion versus relationship. And some mm -hmm. people are just getting to the point where they are making decisions for themselves and not based upon what for their whole lives that's this what you're supposed to do. Wow. Yeah. I I think I think that's a part of of just you know developing into who who you are gonna be um so i know i've definitely experienced that and i'm i'm happy to kind of be on at least i think on the other side of that because i definitely had a lot of the living for other people um but you have to do you know what what you feel is good and what you think is yeah what feeds your soul for sure well those are yeah 
So those are the only questions I have. We have about like five minutes for questions, um, everyone. And then if people have extended questions, um, because the live will go till 7.59. So what we can also do is I can restart it now and then we can rejoin and then have a question session. Um, but it just depends on you and your flexibility and, and the questions that come in. I'm fine either way. I'm fine either way. Okay. So let me go ahead and visit. Oh, hello. Um, let's see. Go ahead and send in those questions. We talked about a lot of different stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, we talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. um, infertility, we talked about the love languages, we talked about communication styles. Um, yep, the con says yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about isolation. Um, we talked about equity in terms of relationships. Yeah. It was really like synthesized into like one brief conversation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because we also have to remember too that all of the things that we're experiencing right now is for any time, all of the things that we experience are going to impact our mental health. <laughs> um, so I think that it, it makes sense. Um, yeah. And, Definitely. and again, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, because some people have like, they didn't get laid off, you know, and they're able to work from home and they enjoy being at home. And it's just like, oh, okay, this is working. But other people, this is all of the yeah. things that are happening have been really hard, you know, for people. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really encountered too many people who, like, have been totally unaffected. Um, and I, it's funny, like, if I think if I was not, like, if I was, you know, back in Virginia, I think it would be so different. But who I'm interacting with now, like, it seems like every single person I talk to, it's like, you know, they had a family member suffer, you know, they, they know someone who else had it, there was a, a job loss, like, there's just so many things, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. So I mean, I I, I think I think there's the, there's a level of gratitude um, that like I think I'm experiencing, and I hope a lot of people are experiencing um, because there is a like even if it's kind of closeted and it's kind of put away, there is a lot of suffering I think going on mm -hmm. um, that at this point might not be covered by the media, but it is happening, mm -hmm. and. Yeah. I just hope we don't know. Yeah. And again, even if we're not directly impacted or whether we realize the impact or not, right? So for me, mm -hmm. I've been blessed to not have, you know, any of anybody in my immediate family that's that's been impacted by the virus and, you know, my nieces and nephews and loved ones and, you know, sisters have okay. continued to work, right? And so um, but just still hearing the stories and seeing all the things on the news. And I think just the, the saddest thing for me is just knowing that people are very sick and alone and, you know, it's impacted. And even if you didn't have a family, even if you lost a family member and it wasn't for the virus, still, even the way we are able to, the way that we typically grieve and celebrate life has to look very different, right? And, talk, and people having to... Right choose which 10 family members are going to go to a funeral. Like, who wants to do that? And those those kinds of things. It's still, whether it's directly related to COVID or not, your impact, your life is still impacted. Even from the way that we bury people to the way that we celebrate life, right? Nobody's having a birthday party. You know, I know, it's, you know, one of my friends had to cancel her 35th birthday party. Another friend had to cancel her 50th. And so it's just like, you know, every, we're, you know, we're all impacted in some way. That's a great point. I didn't even think about that. Like, there's a difference between kind of the health effects and then, you know, how it's inter interrupting mm -hmm. just general kind of life. Right. So, yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any questions in here. Okay. So, um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to send them in. Um, 
you can follow, oh, my, my countdown has started, I have 30 seconds. <laughs> you can follow Joyce, is it? It's at AWS Full Bloom. AWS Full Bloom. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate this conversation and I'm sure everyone else did. Um, and just thank you for being here. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.